Welcome to the full story series right here at Comic Story, where we take some of our older storylines that we've broken into single issues or two to three issues and turn them into a playlist and then we combine them into an epic long journey for you to enjoy. That's the point of the full story series, taking our playlists and turning them into movies you can just pop on and sit for a long drive or sit at your studies or whatever you have to do. Today we're going to be covering Deceased plus the tie-in issue because here at Comic Story we like to give you the true full story, everything that was involved in the particular event to the best of our ability. So today we're going to do issues 1 through 6 of Deceased and then the spin-off book with Constantine. Enjoy! Thunder echoes as blow after blow falls on Darkseid's face, the final punch breaking his jaw and the Kryptonian steps back. Wonder Woman tightens her hold on the lasso of truth, which finds itself wrapped around Darkseid's throat. The invasion lasted a week, but the entirety of the Justice League mobilized to stop it. You will leave Earth now, Darkseid, Superman tells the god glaring at him, and Batman steps forward. You will not return to our world. Say it, Wonder Woman snarls, tightening her hold. The lasso compels you. Darkseid stands, his wound seemingly having no effect on him. He tugs free of the lasso, turning to an opening boom to. I will not return, for I have no need. The truth is, I have what I came for. The cosmic being tells them as he steps through the portal, disappearing. The team straightens up, danger having left their miss. You know, I thought that was going really well, up until that ominous last sentence. Green Arrow equips, slackening the arrow on his bowstring, when suddenly a device on Batman's utility belt begins to chime, bringing everyone's attention to him. Cyborg's missing, he states simply. He's not in Metropolis. He's not on Earth. The group doesn't understand how Batman would know that, but he simply tells them that he has a tracker monitoring Cyborg's every movement. He's a walking weapon with apocalypse technology running through his body and brain, which we've barely scratched the surface of understanding. It would be irresponsible to let that kind of unknown power move freely. The team all stare at Batman as Superman finally asks the question, Did Vic know you were tracking him? Batman's silence is answer enough. And anger courses through the flash as he's suddenly whirling around asking questions. Do you have a tracker on Superman? He finally asks. No. Sighs of exasperation fill the team. Anyone concerned about the slight pause there? Green Arrow asks. The team puts aside the question of the morality of Batman's decision for a moment. They need to find Vic. On Apocalypse, Desaid finishes pushing the final stake through Cyborg's limbs, pinning him to a table like an insect. He smiles a toothy grin, questioning Vic on whether he knows of the anti-life equation. He smiles, explaining that it is the end of all free will. That whoever controls the anti-life equation will dominate all sentient races. Desaid continues to preach, ignoring Cyborg's sarcastic comments, when finally he tells Vic that Darkseid has found the final half of the anti-life equation. In you, the god states as he steps out of the shadows. Cyborg stares at the massive villain, raising one eyebrow. Were you waiting in the corridor to make a good entrance? He asks with a slight smile. The dark ruler stares at him for a moment before ordering Desaid to take his tongue. With a cackle of glee, the torturer sets about his grim task. Darkseid then asks Desaid if he's ready to begin, and the evil minion informs him that if Cyborg is killed by the merging process, then the anti-life equation will be lost. Darkseid nods. We must control Victor Stone's end, he states, pulling free his mother box. I will summon death. Summoned, the black race just suddenly appears in the room, with Darkseid reaching out, grasping the deity by the throat. I have need of you, he growls. Desaid moves forward, using his technology to steal a piece of death. The energy merging with Victor Stone, he begins to chant the anti-life equation. But the use of death corrupts that which is already corrupted in nature. Darkseid can suddenly feel it, scratching at the inside of his mind. And he screams, his fingers clawing at his face. Desaid looks on in fear and the black racer watches with the passivity of death. It is time for God to die. He intones hollowly. To say turns, while immune to the disease, he knows that he must send Cyborg away before all of Apocalypse falls to this. The boom tube opens and suddenly, the hero is gone. But it was too late. Darkseid lashes out and the Black Racer falls. He leaps upward, destroying the city in his wake. And finally, he falls into one of the fiery pits, plummeting to the very core of Apocalypse itself. The planet shudders before it explodes, killing all of those 
that call Apocalypse its home. On Earth, the tube opens, and Victor falls into the streets of Metropolis. He can feel the disease course through him, and he tries to wall it off, yet he is not quick enough. His bloody mouth with no tongue opens to warn those around him. Some try to help, while others are merely taking pictures in their ever-present smartphones. Merging with Victor, though, the equation has become digital, leaping quickly into the internet. From there, it infects all of those that it comes in contact with. Those that surround Vic suddenly become frightened, their fingers clawing at the flesh of their own bodies as they try to scratch free of the disease that has overtaken them. But the fear disappears and the infection spreads. Victor watches as the frightened turn to rage and they begin to lash out at those around them. Meanwhile, in the home of Scott Free and Big Barda, Superman questions his allies about whether they can help him save Victor. Mid-conversation, though, he stops, his super hearing picking up the disturbance in the city. Did you hear that? He asks before leaping through the window. Superman looks below the city. The world is screaming. The people fight and they kill below him, blood flowing from their eyes, their ears, their mouth. Fear fills Superman's eyes as he turns towards home. John, Lois. In their apartment, Lois is looking for her phone when John and Damien play a video game. Damien, where is it? John asks, looking away from the screen. You have x-ray vision, Damien responds. That's actually a good point. He finds the phone on the other side of the room and he begins to reach out for it. But a blast of Superman's heat vision takes it out. And the Man of Steel turns, blasting the TV as well. Don't look at the screens, he orders them. No screens. But in the Batcave, Batman finishes firewalling the Batcave, and he orders the computer to swing to the analog cameras that are positioned around Gotham. He watches as his city tears itself apart. The people are barely human anymore, attacking those that are left. The Bat computer runs projections. 600 billion are infected worldwide, with the virus spreading to the rest of the internet in a matter of days. Has the connection been disabled in the house? He suddenly asks, and the computer voice informs him that it has not. Fear takes over Batman as he suddenly lurches from his chair, ordering the computer to activate the EMP in the manor. Upstairs, the house goes dark. At their apartment, Lois and Clark look out on the city in chaos. I need to assemble the League, Clark tells her. Look out there. Who knows what's left of the League, she tells him. Damien looks down at the radio in his hand, unable to reach his father. The radio is so always supposed to work. Superman continues to look out on the city and he tells Damien that Batman will have contingencies in place. He'll do anything to reach Damien. I've learned to never underestimate your father, he tells him. But at the manor, Batman moves quietly through the darkened house, calling out to his family, and finally hearing Alfred yelling for him from the kitchen. He rushes through the darkness, and he explodes into the room, discovering Alfred trying to hold the infected Nightwing at bay with a knife. The zombie rushes forward, with Bruce managing to knock him aside. Feebly, he tries to reason with Dick, but the young man is no longer there. Tim comes in from behind, biting hard under Batman's arm. Alfred, run! Bruce screams as the boys that he raised begin to bite into him, their hands clawing at his flesh. Run! The first days of the outbreak saw the people of the world isolated from one another. In the middle of the North Atlantic, a ship dips in the waters, gently pushed by the waves of the ocean, and behind it, a trail of shipping containers dip below the water. Pulling himself over the side, Aquaman moves along the deck. Hello, is anyone here? He calls out, and silence is his answer. As he passes one of the bulkheads, a strange noise reaches his ears. It's all right, he calls out, reaching for the handle, pulling the door open. Help is here. But the creatures, they all turn their eyes drawn by the sound and the movement of the door opening. Aquaman can't help it. He stares in surprise at the hold full of the dead. They rush him and the hero falls back as their bloody claws reach for his flesh. Aquaman is pushed back, tumbling over the side of the ship as the dead attack him. They drift beneath the waves until the waters are clouded. But back in Metropolis, John, a.k.a. Superboy, and Damien, a.k.a. Robin, stare out into the destruction of the world that they have known. The city is bright in the distance, alit with dozens of fires. Damien, Batman will be okay, John tells his friend. I'm not worried, John. Why not? I'm like 70% sure this is Armageddon, John tells him, glancing briefly at his stoic friend. I'm not worried, John. Behind them, Lois puts down the phone, telling Clark that her parents are okay and they're headed into the bunker. Superman nods, telling her that he needs to get to Smallville, but not before he knows that they are all safe. The planet, 
Head to the Daily Planet, Lois tells him with a determined look on her face. Meanwhile, over in Gotham City. I want to state for the record that I think this is a terrible idea, Harley tells Poison Ivy, readying her bat. The two stand outside a plain door in the back alley of Gotham. What record? Harley nods to the question, turning and heading away, offering to go ahead and make an official record. But Ivy stops her, vines growing from the earth wrapping around her leg. Should you be using the green like that? Harley asks. Ivy nods and smiles, letting Harley know that the vines actually enjoy crushing people. Right, well, I'll never sleep in the same room as a houseplant again. Ivy steers Harley towards the door again, giving her a kiss on the cheek and tells her that she is strong enough to do this. I'll be waiting by the botanical gardens. Face your monster, she tells her. The door swings open to a dark room with weapons lining against it. Mr. J? Harley calls out in the quiet. The faint flicker of TV screens reach Harley's eyes and she crosses the room, finding the Joker sitting in front of a row of screens. I've been thinking, and I know you don't like it when I do that, she begins. I'm here to say, our life is over, she tells him. The Joker begins to turn, his eyes crazed, his face covered in blood. And outside of Metropolis, I hate camping. I don't know how you two talked me into this. Hal tells Oliver and Dinah as he holds a marshmallow over the fire near the tents. The three friends are chatting around the fire, away from all the screens, with Dinah telling Hal that they just saved the world from an invasion by Darkseid. They deserve a night away from everything. Eventually, Hal walks away from the group, letting them know that he's going to go turn in. He's on his phone, Dinah notes, seeing the gentle glow of the screen through the tent. So much for getting away from it all, Oliver agrees. And suddenly the pair are greeted by strange noises coming out of Hal's tent. The campsite is torn apart as the green hard light constructs erupt outward, throwing Oliver and Dinah away. Hal? Oliver questions from the grass. The pair can only look stunned as the Green Lantern stares at them, his eyes filled with a look of murder. Hal Jordan of Sector 2814, lethal force is not authorized. The ring begins to chime. Oliver realizes what this means and he yells for Dinah to move, diving away as the green tendrils suddenly shoot out of the ground, destroying the spot that they were just at. One of the tendrils nicks Dinah and Oliver doesn't hesitate. He fires his boxing glove arrow to try and stun Hal. The trick arrow seems to have no effect and Hal begins to float over to Dinah. Oliver nods, drawing a deadly arrow next. Jordan, I don't know what's going on with you, man. But the next thing coming at your face isn't a punch. Suddenly, the massive green teeth are launched at Oliver, and fear shines in the hero's eyes. Dinah screams with her canary cry, knocking Jordan away, breaking his concentration. But back in the city, Superman and his family land on the rooftop of the Daily Planet. Lois moves to the doors, knowing that they need to get inside so that they can start linking up with survivors and broadcasting a warning to the world. But Clark stops her scanning the floors below them with his x-ray vision. The whole building is swarming with monsters. People we know? Lois questions. Clark bows his head in sadness as he answers. Yes. Suddenly he turns and he begins to float into the air before turning back to his family. John, do not let anything through that door before I return. I heard something. Back in the forest, Dinah stands over the body of Hal Jordan, Oliver behind him, the former hero laying still. Green Lantern of 2814 is deceased. The ring begins to chime, sliding off of Hal's finger, scanning for a replacement. Briefly, the ring turns before finally hovering in front of Dinah Lance. Dinah Lance of Earth, you have the ability to overcome great fear. Welcome to the Green Lantern Corps. The forest is filled with a bright green light as Dinah is suddenly turned into a lantern. Whoa! Oliver gasps, stunned, but Dinah looks down at herself. She doesn't want this. Take it, Clark tells her as he hovers into view. We're going to need it. The three heroes quickly make their way to the Daily Planet. We made contact, Lois tells Clark as the three heroes come in. Damien holds up his radio. It's Batman! The Dark Knight quickly begins to tell the group that these creatures are not zombies. They're consumed by hunger. They're not feeding. They're spreading death, he tells them. They're stealing life. These are the anti-living. The trigger is an equation. I always knew that math would doom us all, Oliver nods. But Batman doesn't have a lot of time. We see him standing in the Batcave, clad in one of Mr. Freeze's suits in order to slow down his infection. Behind him, Alfred stands ready, shotgun in hand. Bruce, Clark responds, sadness in his voice as he realizes what his friend is saying. But Batman tells him, there's no time for sentiment. The virus is the technological and biological hybrid. To save the world, you're going to have to destroy any human carriers and take down the internet. Oliver nods again. I always expected we'd have to destroy the internet to save the world. I just didn't know it'd be like this. Bruce, 
There must be something we can do for you, Dinah asks. But Batman tells them, There isn't anything. Damien, Alfred has something for you. It's something that I've always wanted to give you. Something I know that you would have earned. One day. Batman says, sadness in his voice, I'm sorry that I won't see you. But the words are choked off, and Damien stares at the radio in his hand. Father! Dad! In the Batcave, Alfred watches as Batman begins to convulse, his hand reaching up, clawing at the helmet of the Mr. Freeze suit. It shatters, spilling glass around the computer. Batman turns, a crazed look filling his eyes as he stares at his butler. Computer, cease transmission, Alfred orders, racking the shotgun. I'm sorry, my son, Alfred tells Bruce as he aims the weapon. That day, the cave was filled with the sound of gunfire. After Alfred was forced to put down an infected Batman with a shotgun, he stands in the Batcave, staring down at the bodies of the three men that he thought of as his sons. My boys, he intones softly. I'm sorry I couldn't save you, he whispers. Though they can no longer hear him, Alfred hangs his head, taking the steel case that Bruce entrusted him with, and he turns to climb aboard the Batwing. The plane streaks across the sky, flying high over the undead, teeming streets of Gotham City. Alfred reaches for the controls, his eyes determined now. And with a click, he releases the bombs, something that Bruce would never have used on living targets. But the people of Gotham, they're no longer alive. The bombs fall, exploding in the streets below, sending the once human population flying, limbs ripping free in the destruction. And Harley runs as the building behind her explodes, rounding the corner and finding a survivor trying to defend himself. His shotgun goes flying as the monsters swarm him. She doesn't hesitate. She grabs her weapon and racks the flesh round in. Back off! I mean it! She yells and the monster that was once the Joker careens down the alleyway towards her. His hands reaching out. She turns, jamming the barrel into the Joker's stomach. Mr. J, you were never any good for me. She snarls, pulling the trigger. The shotgun kicks in her hand and the blast cuts the Joker apart. His body falling to the ground and Harley Quinn staring, shocked. My God, that was the most cathartic thing ever. She yells in triumph and she turns, striding down the alleyway. But she stops when she sees two heroes drop to the ground in front of her. Oh, come on. The zombie birds of prey? She groans as Huntress, Batgirl, Batwoman, and Catwoman land, their eyes blank, their bodies covered in blood. Harley nods as the creatures reach towards her, racking the shotgun once again. Really? Okay. She sighs. I guess we're going bird hunting. But on the rooftop of the Daily Planet, Damien sits against the wall, with John coming over to talk to his friend, but the young boy isn't in the mood. So John just sits with his friend. Is the kid gonna be all right? Oliver asks. And Superman nods as he looks at the two young boys. Damien is his father's son. He'll find a way to bury it and keep on going. But he just lost his dad. Finally, Clark turns to Lois, telling her, I have to go home. I'll secure the building first. Dinah steps forward, asking Superman if he needs any help, but Clark just shakes his head. Thanks, Dinah, but I'll manage. In a blur, he's gone, moving through the building at super speed. He grabs the infected, pulling them out of the building and dropping them into the streets. After the last of the infected are deposited outside, he flies upwards, ripping free the Daily Planet globe, dropping it in front of the exit. Landing on the rooftop, he gives his family one last hug before he goes, with Damien watching from his seat. Ollie, Dinah, please keep my family safe. Clark asks his friends as he takes to the air. Of course, Dinah tells him, the newest Green Lantern. Deep below the ocean, the tide swirls against the ancient city of Atlantis. Concentrate, Garth! Mara hisses. You can do this! You can push against the tides! And if you can't, maybe you should rethink the name Tempest! She tells him. From now on, your new superhero name is going to be Mild Weather Event. But the ocean around them grows darker, and the two Atlanteans look up. It's not the setting sun that darkens their day, it's the water itself. Blood is clouding the water around them as Aquaman, turned into one of the infected hordes, fights through the warriors of Atlantis. The blood seeps down, filling the lungs of Tempest, with Mera trying to warn him. But it's too late, and Garth suddenly roars as his brain is altered by the infected blood. His fingers begin to tear at the flesh of his face as Mera watches in horror. 
The infected rush towards her as she looks on with fear in her eyes. And as she begins to swirl the waters using her power, she screams out, You will not take me! She flees as all of Atlantis is consumed by the blood around her. But back with Superman, he flies towards Smallville. He can't help but stop and aid the survivors that he passed along the way. His breath saved a couple from the horde, and he later lifted up a school bus to safety. Along the way, he also found Black Lightning and his family, fighting an infected Clayface. The villain fell quickly, though, and Superman told the hero to head towards the Daily Planet. Finally, he arrives at his family farm. He arrives home. Martha stands in the yard, shovel in hand, as she stares at the barn door. Where's Pa? He asks, and his mother motions quietly to the barn, before telling him. He's inside. Gently, Clark opens the door, stepping inside of the cool building, and beneath his feet he can hear his father banging on the hatch to the root cellar. He reaches down, snapping the lock without any effort, and then he opens the door to reveal his father, crazed, covered in blood. The man who raised him reaches for him, thirsty for death and destruction. Clark takes his arms, sadness filling his face as he forces his father back into the cellar and he shuts the door. His heat vision cuts through the door quickly. He steps back outside, his mother standing there in tears, crying. It's time to go, he tells her. But she shakes her head. We can't leave. This is our home, your father. She begins to cry as Clark lifts her in his arms. He isn't here, Ma. He tells her as they leave the place that he grew up. He isn't here. The streets of Washington, D.C. are bright with fire and destruction. Deep below the earth, Captain Adams stands in the Cadmus headquarters, looking at the dead body of an infected woman. Any word? Amanda Waller asks behind him. Adam shakes his head, telling her that Ray Palmer is still inside of the woman, trying to figure out a way to destabilize the virus from the inside. But Waller just shakes her head. They've activated Plague Protocol C. Satellite imagery has isolated the worst infected areas, and we need you to start exercising the infection, she tells him. I'm sorry. Captain Adam flies over the city streets, using his powers of radiation to burn the infection away. His blast cuts through the creatures that line the streets, but suddenly his eyes go wide. Amanda, something's inside me. Within Captain Adam's body, the infected Ray Palmer continues to attack his bloodstream. His eyes are crazed, and his hands attack anything that gets close. Outside, Captain Adam screams as the infection attacks from within. Meanwhile, back at the Daily Planet, Clark finally arrives with his mother. For a brief moment, John is happy, asking about his grandfather, but Martha only begins to cry and Lois moves in to comfort her. Briefly, the family comes together in their grief, embracing one another. But afterwards, Lois explains that they're almost ready to start broadcasting to any survivors. I can't stop. I have to get back out there, Superman tells her in the group, but Oliver puts his hand on the Man of Steel's shoulder. We talked about it. You can't, Superman. I understand that restraining you with my hand is entirely symbolic, and I know that you can walk straight through me. Diana steps forward, telling Clark, It's too dangerous for you to be out there. If you saw a scream, I won't, Clark assures her. I've been using my x-ray vision from the nanosecond that I worked out what was causing this, he tells her. Diana finally nods, letting Clark know that she's just going to come with him. Lois steps up, finally broadcasting to as much of the world as they can reach. This is Lois Lane of the Daily Planet. I know the world looks like a nightmare. If you can hear me, I know you're scared, but you are not alone. Around the world, survivors huddle in the dark rooms, pulling closer their radios. Heroes, who weren't sure if they were the last ones, feel a measure of hope. Villains, who once planned to rule the world, pause at the death and destruction before them. We are regrouping. The Justice League is gathering in Metropolis. Anyone with power or means to confront this, please come to the Daily Planet roof, if it is safe and if you are capable of doing so. Meanwhile, on Amazon Island, Mara stands before Queen Hippolyta, having actually survived. My city is gone. My people are gone. I didn't know where else to go, she tells her. Hippolyta steps forward, reaching out an arm to the proud Queen of Atlantis. You are welcome in Themyscira. Behind them, Wonder Woman stands, listening to Lois's message, and finally she turns to her mother as she questions where she's going. Metropolis. Lois continues her message as Superman and Black Canary search for the heroes that might be able to give them more time. I've seen them, Clark tells her, using his ability to find Wally West and Barry Allen. He rips off the door to their bunker, but Barry looks at him in fear. We can't leave, Superman. 
Batman told us what to do. If either one of us becomes infected, it would spell disaster. I can move you safely, Dinah tells them. Barry looks at her in surprise. You're a Green Lantern now? Back in Gotham, Harley stops and turns, firing the shotgun down the alleyway. The spread rips through the zombie birds of prey, but it doesn't stop them. She racks another shell, squeezing the trigger, but the weapon clicks empty. Aw, oh, nuts, she whispers. But the birds are suddenly thrown aside as vines wrap around them, and Poison Ivy steps forward, her vines crushing the zombies. Now that was pretty romantic, Harley tells her, taking her hand. Crushing the undead is romantic. The two head off into the city, leaving the undead behind them. Come, the green will protect us, Ivy tells her. And on the rooftop of the Daily Planet, Lois begins her message once again. But John stops her as he hears something. It sounds like thunder, he whispers. It sounds like impending doom, Oliver tells them. Trust me, I've been doing this for a long time. I have a finely tuned ear for the impending. Everyone's eyes grow big as Giganta pulls her way up the building, the giant zombie reaching for the heroes. Black Lightning and Green Arrow open fire, yelling for the others to push her back, when suddenly missiles sail out of nowhere, exploding against the giant creature. Damien looks on shocked as the Batwing sails in, but Giganta reaches out, snagging the plane out of the sky. It begins to spiral and crash, but Dinah reaches out, plucking it from the sky with a giant green hand. Superman, take her down, she screams. The Man of Steel doesn't even slow, barreling into the giant, knocking her to the ground. Superman, move! Wonder Woman orders as she flies in, her sword gleaming and ready to strike. But Clark catches her, stopping the attack. Are you serious, Clark? That is an undead giant. I'm not giving it time to get back up. But Clark tries to reason with her, letting her know that there is still hope for saving everyone. When suddenly, Giganta explodes into a shower of blood and guts. Cyborg stands there, his hand cannon smoking from the shot that blew a hole in the giant zombie's head. She wasn't alive, he tells them, and Superman looks at him shunned. None of them are. We need to talk. Up on the rooftop, Dinah gently lowers the Batwing, with Damien running over yelling for his father. But that cockpit raises, and it reveals Alfred. Damien, I'm sorry, my son. He tells the boy, sadness in his eyes. Alfred lowers the case, opening it to the boy, and inside, there's a bat suit and Batman gear awaiting its heir. He said you were worthy of it, that he was proud of you and that he should have told you that every day. Tears begin to fill the eyes of Damien as he closes the distance between him and Alfred and the two embrace. On the rooftop, special lenses are given to Wally and Barry to protect their eyes from accidentally looking at any screens. But Cyborg is there now, trying to explain that these creatures aren't zombies. Hey man, if it groans like a zombie and shuffles like a zombie, Oliver starts, but Cyborg explains that the creatures are a blight, an extension of the anti-life equation. The blighted ones want to spread death, nothing more, he tells them. Oliver calls out to Hawkgirl, who suddenly drops out of the sky from above them, her wings blackened and singed. Wonder Woman grabs her, asking what happened. Captain Adam, she tries to tell them. He turned and he's going to blow. In DC, Captain Adam continues to pulse with power. Superman and Wonder Woman speed forward, trying to stop him. They reach out, snagging the former hero in their arms. Superman, hold him! Wonder Woman screams as the radiation hits them both, but the hero suddenly erupts, the blast catching them both, and it begins to spread outward, destroying everything in its path. The survivors on the Daily Planet watch as the blast radius crawls towards them, Black Lightning reaching for his family, pulling them close. Close your eyes, he tells them. Hold on to me. And the light fills their world until that is all there is. Superman and Wonder Woman float over the remains of Washington, D.C., the city scorched, the smoking landscape below them. Metropolis. Superman whispers, and the two take off at top speed. The city passes beneath them, destroyed by the dying blast of Captain Adam. When they arrive in the city, though, they find the remains of the Daily Planet, floating in a bright green ball. Clark reaches out, and within the orb, Lois presses her hand against her husband's. Suddenly, from below, a voice calls out, reaching Superman's ears. Superman! Lex calls. The Man of Steel floats down to his greatest enemy. His eyes burning with anger. Lex, by row of you so much as... He snarls. But Lex holds up his hands, offering a truce with his former enemy. I'm not here to... Lex begins, but he can't finish as he falls to his knees. Look what happened to our city. Tears in his eyes. 
Days pass and the heroes work to stop the spread, with Flash taking out the internet, speeding around the globe, destroying all of the servers. In space, Diana works to take out every major broadcasting device, her sword destroying the floating satellites. Next, she heads to Themyscira, where she convinces her mother to open up the island to the survivors of the world. We're supposed to be their protectors. It is time that we offered protection here, she tells them. With her agreement, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Mara use their powers to lift more of the sea floor, creating more landmass on Amazon Island. In Gotham, the jungle grew around the city, walling it off against the infection. Dinah, Damien, and Oliver arrive, hoping to convince Poison Ivy to accept more refugees in her jungle safe haven. Let me do the talking, Damien tells him, clad in his bat suit. Are you sure you're not exactly a people person? Oliver asks. Ivy's not exactly people. Suddenly there's a roar behind them, and the creature that was once Killer Croc leaps from the bushes. Arrows and batarangs fly, but it is the vines that pierce his flesh, which finally end the monster. The vines then circle the heroes, but Damien orders his friends not to hurt the plants. Good call, bad boy. Harley smiles as the gate opens to reveal her and Poison Ivy. Why are you here? Why is Robin dressed as a tiny Batman? Ivy asks, pulling Damien closer. Batman's gone, he tells her. The two villains look surprised, and even Ivy turns a sad eye to the boy. I'm sorry, she tells him. Once they are freed, Damien asks the villain that they be allowed to bring the survivors to her jungle, to be protected from the plague. Harley smiles, admitting that she has been trying to convince Ivy to do just that, but Poison Ivy crosses her arms, sighing. <sighs> there will be rules. Elsewhere. Cyborg and Luther were able to set up closed communications, setting the Fortress of Solitude as a new information hub, and the remaining heroes of Earth gather there. This is quite impressive, Victor, Luther admits. Why have we never worked together before? You kept trying to kill me and my friends, Cyborg tells him. Sure, but in my defense, that was before I realized you could be useful. Green Arrow joins the duo, asking what they are working on as Cyborg leans over his blueprints. The two look up, telling him that they are plans for arcs. Each arc can hold seven million people, Lex tells Superman as the hero joins them. But Superman just looks at him sternly. We're not leaving. Superman, I am the most intelligent person on the planet. Lex suddenly stops and looks over his shoulder at Cyborg. Wait, Batman is dead, yes? Yes, Cyborg nods. Right, then I am the most intelligent person on the planet and I'm telling you, the world is over. If the human race is going to survive, we have to leave the Earth. Anger fills Superman's voice and he tells him, we are not leaving the Earth if we can help it. Lex suddenly smiles, realizing what this means. Losing two homeworlds in one lifetime, how careless. But Lois is there, her fist cracking the villain across the jaw. Open your mouth against my husband again and I will smash it closed. Understood. She stomps away, turning to see John and Damien smiling at her. Uh, violence is not the answer, John, she tells him. And the Boy of Steel looks at his friend and he smiles. Looked like a pretty good answer to me. Weeks pass and survivors are brought to Gotham and Themyscira. Construction of the arcs also begins with the heroes mourning those that were lost. But as time passes, in the fortress, the heroes begin to twitch as buzzing fills their ears. The buzz erupts into a scream, and some of them begin to fall to the ground, when suddenly Lex is cut in half, his body falling to the floor in a spray of flash whirls around trying to see their attacker. Martian Manhunter suddenly appears, slashing him across the back, drawing blood. Quickly, the heroes try to defend themselves, but it is Firestorm whose voice can be heard. MOVE! He orders as the flames around him flare up, and the blast shoots across the room, cutting through the Manhunter. The monster dies, melting in an amorphous pile, but Wally suddenly turns. Barry, where did Barry go? Where is the Flash? Superman looks outward, using his supervision. He's running, he tells him, and Wally nods, preparing to sprint after him, but Clark stops him, turning with a look of determination in his eyes. I'll go. Do you think you can even catch him? Oliver asks. No. The Flash, now infected, is running through the world at super speed, infecting those that have managed to survive. In orbit, Superman looks down at the world below still, despite the death and destruction that now spreads across it. He asks over the comms. He is. Promise me. I promise, Superman. Superman nods, and he begins to fly, picking up speed as he goes. Over the comm, Cyborg asks how the Man of Steel intends to catch the fastest man alive, but Clark just tells him, I don't have to. I just need to fly in the opposite direction and meet him. Head on. Sadness fills the Man of Steel as he smashes through the Flash, sending bones, blood, and flesh scattering, destroying him in one second. He turns, looking back on the mist that was his friend only moments ago. Barry, 
I'm so sorry. But then he stops, and he looks down, and he realizes that the Flash's bones and fingers have pierced his skin. Even now, the Man of Steel, our one beacon of hope, can feel the infection taking over. He moves fast, crossing the world in seconds, returning to the fortress, and he stops, telling Wally that he's sorry for what happened to Barry. He asks him if he can connect him to the Speed Force. So Wally nods, seeing that Superman doesn't have very long. And Superman goes to his family. Ma, thank you for finding me, for raising me, for teaching me, for giving me your name, your values, and your empathy. He tells Martha, and he hugs her, bringing her in close. My world ended, and you and Pa give me another one. Next, he turns to Lois, his wife, tears filling her eyes as he pulls her close. I don't know how I got so lucky. I crossed an ocean of stars, and somehow I found you. Thank you for choosing me, he tells her. Finally, he turns to his son, who's already crying. I know things look dark, but you are the light. You are the hope. You are going to change the universe. I know it, he tells his son. No pressure. He smiles as tears spill out of his eyes. I've seen so much of the universe, and you're the best thing in it, John. With those final words, Superman rockets out of the fortress and into space, and as he clears the atmosphere, he looks into the cold void of space and suddenly stops. His eyes go wide. He took too long. The blight suddenly takes him, and he roars in anger in space, and suddenly his eyes burn with heat, and he turns back to the Earth. No longer our beacon of hope, but now the beacon of our nightmares. He is faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. And as cold rain falls on what is left of New York City, the people look up and they smile. For Superman, always inspired hope. But their smiles of hope soon turn to stunned looks of fear as the Man of Steel plummets towards the Earth. The people can't see his crazed eyes or the blood leaking out of his ears. They hear the guttural screams of rage. He smashes Earthward hard, destroying the world's largest residential building with an earth-shattering quake that wipes out most of New York in seconds. The end has begun. In the Fortress of Solitude, the remaining heroes have gathered around Cyborg. If Superman is turned, it's over. It's just over. The Ark's ready. If we leave Earth now, he tells them, but Lois shakes her head. Superman can take down both Arks in a heartbeat. We have to take him on, Wonder Woman agrees. And it is Black Lightning who questions how they can stop the most powerful being on the planet. With this, Damien tells him, holding up a small case from his utility belts with Superman's symbol on it. Batman left a takedown plan for every major hero, Damien explains. And Green Arrow steps forward, mildly amused. Of course he did. Batman doesn't even have to be alive to scheme against us all. Damien pauses for a moment. Actually, he didn't have one for you. Oliver stopped short, shocked that Bruce didn't even think that he was dangerous. You're hurt because Batman didn't have a post-mortem Machiavellian plan to end you? Dinah asks. Well, yeah. I could be a planetary threat if I wanted to be, Eroke tells her, crossing his arms, pouting just a little. Of course you could, dear. Damien removes the container, showing the kryptonite to the group. Within are also a set of schematics that Cyborg can use to create a kryptonite gas that will slow down Superman. That's not enough, Wonder Woman states, stepping forward. Bruce was a lot of things, but he was never lethal. It was admirable. But we can't hold back now, she tells the group. Dinah steps forward, asking if she has a plan. Of course. You think Batman is the only one with enough sense to plot against his friends? She turns, ordering Dinah and Cyborg to follow her while the others go and begin to load the arcs. The three heroes move through the Fortress of Solitude, and deep within, they find Superman's forge, where Wonder Woman begins to create. Her hammer rings through the icy fortress as she forges a weapon that could kill a god from beyond the stars. And while she works, she explains that Clark is most vulnerable to kryptonite and magic, and that she and her mother believed that they could combine the two. Are you sure that it'll work? Dinah asks, watching as the warrior combines her sword with the kryptonite. This is the sword of Athena. Athena was a war goddess. We fight of everything, she tells them, the hammer ringing. She was the goddess of craft. We have fused mythology with an element from a world that no longer exists. The blade dips into the icy waters, cooling and sizzling, until Wonder Woman holds it before her. Last, she was the goddess of mathematics. We are fighting an equation. This is not a coincidence. I believe we hold fate in our hands. With their work done, the three heroes fly to try and save the last people of their worlds. 
in Gotham, the last civilians are loaded onto the Ark, with Damien turning to Wally, telling him that it's time to go. But Ivy steps forward, shaking her head. I am not abandoning the Green, she tells him, and Harley is at her side, smiling. And I'm not abandoning her. Minutes go by, and the two watch, hand in hand as the Ark leaves them behind. And Themyscira, Green Arrow calls, are the last of the survivors to get on board. And as they wait, Queen Hippolyta and Queen Mera are interrupted as one of the Amazons points to the strange storm rolling from the sea. Briefly, Mera stares in stunned fear before speaking to the Queen of the Amazons. Move the evacuation to high ground. Ready your warriors around the Ark and the refugees. Is it a storm? Hippolyta asks. No, it is a tempest. The waters suddenly churn and break as mighty tentacled beasts rise out of the ocean depths. The creature roars into the storm and hundreds of Atlanteans taken by the anti-life equation boil out of the sea. The Kraken, Mara hisses. From the creature's back, Aquaman appears with his own roar of rage and pain mixing with an army of undead the one that he commands. His cries are cut off as an arrow pierces his eye though. Dead, he plummets from the monster's back and into the ocean below. And Batman didn't think I could be dangerous, Green Arrow whispers, his bow in hand. Just fired an arrow half a mile and raging winds into the brain of the undead king of the sea while he's controlling a damned kraken. Screw you, Batman. Hippolyta orders her warriors to assemble as Mera tries to hold off the rest of the undead horde with her water magic. The two queens stand side by side, trying to hold off the tide of the dead, but they are not alone. Without fear, the Amazons of Themyscira crash into the dead of the deep. And in New York, Superman roars, his heat vision flashing out, destroying all that is around him. He wasn't that hard to find, Dinah notes as they fly over the ruins of the city. Cyborg confirms that no one is alive, and Dinah nods. Then I don't have to hold back. She says, creating a megaphone with her ring to amplify her canary cry. The piercing shriek shakes the ground around them and the shockwaves crash into the Man of Steel who falls to his knees. But over in Themyscira, the Amazons continue their battle, their blades hacking into the undead Atlanteans. Fists and feet lash out and arrows find their targets as the brave warriors try to hold back the tide. But they begin to fall. With every bite and scratch, the virus is transmitted and another warrior joins the ranks of the undead. Green Arrow keeps firing, holding the door as the last of the refugees gets on board. He yells for Mera, telling the queen that they need to leave, and her fist punches through another undead. Amazons! She shouts back. But Oliver motions to the vast army of the undead that fight below them. Mera, there's no extracting them from that, he tells her, sadness in his voice. On the beach, Apollo's fists throw more Atlanteans aside as she orders Wonder Girl to retreat. The queen knows that she won't be leaving this beach. And in a brief moment, she hands her crown to the young girl. Tell my daughter that the promise of Themyscira is hers to honor now. The young girl nods, flying from the battle to join the Ark. And on the beach below, the battle rages on. The Amazon stayed so that millions could flee. And eventually, they fell. They fell fighting. Paradise held off oblivion. And in New York, Superman has begun his battle with the Canary Cry, slowly gaining ground on Dinah. Her radio crackles and Oliver tells her that the arcs are away. Dinah can't hold out her cry. And Superman charges, smashing against the green shield that she has thrown up. Cyborg fires a shot, hoping to hold the Man of Steel off. But Superman's grasp begins to crack the shield. Suddenly, Diana is there. Her kryptonite lace sword slicing through the arm of Superman. She rears back, stabbing into his chest, and the Man of Steel roars in pain with his fist punching through her stomach. Dinah screams as Wonder Woman falls to the earth, and Cyborg watches as Superman rockets into the sky, chasing after the arcs. The two heroes gather around Diana on the ground, blood coughing through her lips. <laughs> He's seen the arcs, she tells them, her words strained. You have to stop him, she tells Dinah, handing her the sword. Green Canary stares down at the weapon in her hands before finally turning to Vic. It's okay, I'll stay with her, he tells his friend, and Dinah tries to tell him that he can't stay, but Vic shakes his head. The virus started with me, Dinah. I was never coming with you. In space, John and Damien stand at the viewport, looking down at the earth below them. He's coming, my dad, John tells his friend, and the two friends look panicked at each other. Can you do anything? Damien asks. Look after my mom. The young boys share a final hug. You're gonna be a great Batman, buddy. John whispers. Lois tries to stop her son, but John knows what to do, revealing the shield on his chest, the last beacon of hope. He rockets into space, 
John is the only one standing between the last survivors of Earth and extinction. His father would be so proud. The two Kryptonians rocket towards each other, connecting in the darkness of space, the force of the blow echoing throughout the void. But Superman is only stunned as John drifts away. But that moment was all that they needed. Dinah flies forward prepared to fight and end this battle. She readies the sword, but suddenly she's bathed in green light. Attention Green Lantern of Sector 2814, her ring chimes. More Green Lanterns swarm around her, coming to her aid. Seriously, Dinah? Guy Gardner asks with a smile. I leave you alone for one month and the whole place goes to hell? Dinah questions what is happening and one of the Guardians explains that the Lanterns are quarantining Earth. Which, you know, isn't great because this is our space sector. Losing our whole world kind of reflects very badly upon us. Gardner notes, Dinah is shocked that he is still joking at a time like this. Hey, I might not have the incredible willpower of Hal Jordan or the stunning creativity of Kyle Rayner, but I am a master of masking my emotional terror with jokes, he tells her. The lanterns all turn to see the undead men of steel floating before them. What is Superman doing? Guy asks. Dinah tells them that the creature is thinking, trying to decide if it can take them all on. The monster stares at them silent for a few moments, and then it turns, and it flies away. The lanterns give chase, but the monster disappears into the sun. The guardian orders the lanterns to stop, and deep within the sun, the monster stretches, absorbing the energy from the star. It's feeding, draining the sun, the guardians explain. In time, this entire solar system will be cold and die. Dinah floats next to him, questioning whether the lanterns are going to let this happen. Even the Green Lantern's light is not powerful enough to reach into the heart of a star. The Guardian explains, When the sun dies, the virus will sleep. The Lanterns will monitor the situation as needed, and finally the Corps will provide escort as the Arcs make their way into deep space searching for a new home for humanity. On Earth, Cyborg watches as Wonder Woman roars in a rage, her eyes dead now. I have a question, Cyborg shouts, tightening his hold on the lasso of truth. Can you speak? Wonder Woman stops her thrashing and she straightens up. We have a voice, she growls. He asks if there's a way to stop them. We are death. Nothing can stop us. You are a virus. Can you be cured? Yes. The rain falls around them as Cyborg asks where the cure is. The monster that was Wonder Woman struggles and he tightens his grip further. Where? She stops again. The cure is in you. Cyborg is stunned as she explains that Vic is both man and machine. Off and on, patient zero, the one, the alpha, and the omega. Vic drops the lasso looking into the sky. He needs to tell the arcs. Wonder Woman roars, wrapping her arms around his head, twisting it with all her strength. She throws the head away, letting the body fall to the ground. Life is fleeting. That is the only truth. The monster whispers, death is eternal. The arcs travel and the lanterns provide support. And eventually, John and Lois stand before one of the viewports. A tear in her eyes as her and her son look out the window, looking at the world that lays before them. They look over this new world, their fresh beginning, their Earth too. They are finally safe. The monsters are all behind them now. The boom tube opens in the midst of the vast destruction. It's true, Barta says to Mr. Miracle. Apocalypse, the whole planet. God is dead, Miracle nods, bowing his head for a moment, knowing that his father is dead. How do you feel? Barta asks him, and Scott looks at her for a moment. Honestly, pretty good, he tells her with a smile. They kiss amidst the destruction before turning back to their tube, leaving the planet of Apocalypse to its own devices. They need to go back to Earth and face what God has unleashed upon them. Captain Boomerang is pushing against his restraints, his eyes dead and blood covering his body. Some from the cuts all over, some from his victims. Mr. Terrific stares down at the creature deep in thought. No response to audio or visual stimuli, he says into the recorder. No reaction to touch or pain. No noticeable change after second exposure to virus. He taps a few buttons on his screens. Noting that he has 14 PhDs, but he is still stumped. An alarm beeps and Terrific tells his recorder that they have to go to the source. And he launches himself out the window. On the streets, the creatures see the man leave and shamble after him. Barta and Scott stare out the window. Do we just, like, go out and start hitting Scott? They turn as a knock sounds at the door and Barta moves to answer it, with Scott grabbing her hand, asking, What are you doing? 
I don't think the undead knock that politely. She smiles at him, and Scott thinks that it only sounds like a knock. It could be a bloody stump banging against the door, and then the doorbell rings. The bloody stump found the doorbell. She smiles, answering the door, revealing Terrific standing there, explaining that he was tracking the planet for apocalyptic tech and got a spike when they arrived. Scott comes out with a veggie platter, because you always celebrate with a veggie platter. Mr. Terrific explains that he's been studying the virus and his T-visor shields him from its effect. Did you know that it would do that? Scott asks him. No. You're one of the smartest men on the planet and you just got lucky? Yes. Terrific explains that he needs to go back to Apocalypse to find a cure for this virus. But Barda tells him that the place is destroyed. Then we move on to other plans. Later, at Cord Industries, Booster Gold and Blue Beetle stand ready, the door being pounded on by the undead. It's okay. The door is solid titanium. Ted tells his friend, when suddenly it explodes inward and the dust settles, revealing Big Barda. Hi, she says, leaping back outside to join the fight with the zombies. Do you want some help? Booster calls out, but Mr. Terrific's T-spheres cut through most of the zombies and the others are quickly dispatched. No, I'd, I'd say we're good, she tells him. It's good to see you, Barda, Ted tells her. You too. I'd give you a hug, but I'm covered in undead bits, she smiles. I have a part of an ear in my tights, Mr. Miracle notes. Later, the group is flying overhead in the bug, Blue Beetle's airship. It really is the end of the world, isn't it? He notes, looking down at the sea of the undead that team beneath them. I still hope we have a say in that, Terrific tells them all. Barda then asks why they don't go to the Justice League, but Terrific shakes his head. He doesn't want to be around if one of the most powerful beings on the planet gets infected by the anti-life equation. Terrific tells them that the origin of the virus is gone, so the next choice is to turn to magic. Magic is, like, notoriously unreliable. What if it's a dead end? Ted asks. Terrific is quiet for a moment before answering. There is a third option, but it could go badly. In Liverpool, John Constantine runs down the streets, hordes of undead chasing him down. Chaz! He screams, jumping into the backseat of his friend's cab. Chaz, start the car! He slams the door shut, barring the undead for a moment, but then he stares in shock as Chaz turns to him from the front. Blood covers his face from where he tore his own skin, and rage is filling his eyes. The creature reaches out for Constantine, growling. Oh, mate, I'm so sorry, John tells him calmly, his eyes burning with mystical fire. He mutters a spell and his friend bursts into flames, burning to ash before him. John pulls himself into the front seat as the monsters continue to hammer on the windows. He peels it down the street, leaving the horde behind him for a moment before slamming into another car. Ugh, why didn't I learn to drive? He groans. The horde swarms around his car, but suddenly they burst into flames. And John stares around, momentarily stunned. John Constantine, Mr. Terrific calls on the lights of the bug. John smiles, rolling down the window. Why can't you people have, like, regular names? He asks. I mean, Mr. Terrific, what kind of arrogant sod is comfortable walking around with that hanging over him? John steps out, sitting on the hood of the car as the undead burn around him. Are you okay? Scott asks him. Peachy! Just set my best man on fire and crashed his car while sitting on his ashes. How's your day going? My planet is destroyed. All right, it's not a competition. Mr. Terrific tells John that they can't find a technological solution for the problem, and they're hoping that he had a magical one. You think I can just click my fingers and make this all go away? John asks, waving his hands at the carnage around them. He shakes his head, telling them that this is beyond magic. You're not going to help? Terrific asks him. I'm going to hide and get so irresponsibly drunk that I can hardly feel anything. Care to join me? We have a world to save. Right, all of you pop and do that then, John tells them. The group turn to go, flying away in the bug with Ted watching from the window as John moves his hands, casting a portal and stepping through it. Our magician just stepped through a portal and vanished. Yes, it's option three. Terrific sighs, and the group turns, questioning what their third option could be. It's you, he says, pointing at Booster. Booster Gold, I believe you're the only person who can save humanity. Booster stares at him. You're supposed to be a great thinker. Think better. Terrific looks at him. You own a time machine. Ted turns to his friend asking, where is your time machine? It's in safe hands, Teddy, Booster tells him. And later, the bug hovers over the home of fire and ice in Malibu. Well, this doesn't look good. Booster notes, staring down at the destruction below him. Barda notes that it looks like they fought hard, but there's no way of knowing if they're still alive down there. Mr. Miracle yells a warning as he sees fire flying towards them, her body ablaze covered in blood. She slams into the bug hard, knocking it out of the sky in a green blaze. Barda kicks the door free, yelling for the group to get to the house. So Barda and Scott hold the zombies at bay, yelling for the others to run. Fire and ice appear, and the two heroes begin to become overwhelmed, with Barda yelling out, There are too many! Knocking ice away from her. 
We can always escape, Scott tells her, his kick connecting with Fire's stomach. But they can't. They need to hold off the horde to save the world. We have to give Booster a chance to save the universe, Scott tells her as he lashes out at another creature. What a ridiculous statement, Barda notes as they fight. The creature slashes at Scott and he falls, and Barda catches him in her arms. But if he can turn back time, if he can find a way, he gasps as the horde closes in on them. Are your last words really going to be quoting Cher? Barda asks, holding her love in her arms. Scott reaches out, caressing Barda's cheek. I like Cher, he whispers. The horde crashes in around them, and they're lost at a sea of the undead. Inside, the team runs through the building, blasting the undead as they pass, with Booster leading them into the basement. But he stops short when he sees the being standing before his time machine. Michael Carter, Wave Rider tells them, his arms crossed over his chest. You will not be permitted to change time. Meanwhile, over at the pocket dimension of the Oblivion Bar, John Constantine sits at the counter. What can I get for you, John? Bubba the Chimp asks. John nods, pointing over the chimp's shoulder. Give me the bottle from the top shelf that made the Phantom Stranger forget his name, he tells him, and John stares at the bottle for a moment before cursing and getting to his feet. Tell anyone who asks that I was out of my scone when I decided to do this. He calls over his shoulder when he heads for the door. Where are you going? Bobo asks. To be a bloody hero. Back with our heroes at the time machine, Wave Rider is standing before the heroes, the flames of his head shifting in the room as he blocks the time machine. Wave Rider is a guardian of time, preventing any changes to the timeline. You are under arrest, Michael Carter. The machine will be confiscated. Oi! John calls, portaling into the chamber in a swirl of magical energy. Take a look, Sparkle Face! Can you see my future? He asks, crossing his arms. Wave Rider stares at the man, confusion crossing his features. No. John nods, crossing the room, telling the being, Watch my hand! This is called misdirection, he tells them, and he rears back, head-butting Wave Rider. The being falls, clutching his broken nose. Yeah, you didn't see that coming, did you, Time Lord? He smirks, turning to the group, his hands glowing with magic. Do what you do. I'll hold off shiny hair here, he tells them. But suddenly the walls explode inward and Barda emerges. She launches herself at John Constantine. Terrific knocks the woman off of Constantine, trying to throw her away, but Barda's hand lashes out, slashing Mr. Terrific across the stomach. Bloody hell, John whispers, with Beetle yelling for Booster to go now, to use the time machine. Booster struggles to move, but he falls. What's wrong? Get up! Ted yells at his friend. It is as it should be, Wave Rider tells them, and he explains that they have reached the end, that Kal-El has found Barry Allen in the destruction of Keystone City. Teddy, Booster groans, bringing his friend over. I think we just lost the future. I don't think I was ever born, he mumbles, and Booster begins to fade from existence as Ted yells for him to hold on. I'm sorry, I'll never get to know you, Booster whispers as he fades away. Ted stares in sadness at where his friend once was, but Barda is there knocking him away, slashing into him. It's time for me to go, Wave Rider says, staring at the mass of monsters. You get to just walk away? You're happy that this is the timeline you chose to protect? John asks him. A portal opens and Wave Rider begins to walk through and he turns back to the magician. No, I am far from happy. Goodbye, John Constantine. I don't know if we'll ever meet again. Oh, we'll meet again. I'll find you, John promises. And he suddenly snaps out his hand, grasping the Wave Rider, who is frozen. What have you done? Why can't I move? Because you're bound to me. I can see the future, John tells him as the undead close in on them. It's short. The monsters lash out and Wave Rider is cut down, blood spurting out of his body. John turns to the hordes as they close in around him, waiting for death. But suddenly, the creatures stop moving. A voice yells. He turns to see a portal opening up to reveal Dr. Fate and Zatanna. Dr. Fate reaches out his hand. John Constantine, it is not your time. Another fate awaits you. John lashes out, cracking fate across the helmet. And then he clutches his hurt hand in frustration. Brute force cannot hurt the hell, fate tells him. John holds out his hands, motioning to the death around him. I get a last second rescue, but the real heroes had to die, he asks. And Fate explains that Bobo told them where he had gone. I'm sorry that we didn't get here any sooner. Fate's eyes glow as he stares at the magician. The world is ending, John Constantine. We must prepare for what comes next. The Lords of Order and Chaos can eat a bag of bullocks, John interrupts him. The world isn't over until I say it is. And there you have it, a full story of Deceased. I hope you guys enjoyed, and I hope you got the message of the book that basically if zombies take over, we are screwed. 
Either way, thank you so much for your support, and thank you for sticking around to the ending of this extra long video. Really does help our channel out, you just sticking around and watching, even if you weren't fully paying attention at certain points, or just let it roll in the background. A lot of these things really do help us, and I really appreciate you. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time, right here.